look, you don't have to be a genetic freak in order to be successful in your sport. And even in order to be professional in your sports. So yeah, I think, you know, there's sort of just this assumption that more is better when it comes to skills. And I don't, I don't know if that's really true. This is something that I get worked up over because, you know, I, I deal with these athletes, like I, I coach them and I want them to succeed. And I really think in some cases they are, they're up against it. You know, they don't, the system is basically forcing them that they have to do all these things. And so then there's not really opportunity for them to develop as an athlete. This video is an interview with Daniel Bach. Daniel is an absolute beast. He is one of the best resources I've found online that cuts through all the noise when exploring the limits of explosive movements like jumping ability, maximum sprint speed, agility, and more. The video I made about the limit of maximum sprint speed was inspired by Daniel's work. Daniel has coached elite athletes out of acceleration in Austin, Texas for many years, and he is the founder of Jump Science. I'm relatively new to interviews, and I made some mistakes with the recording setup so you will see random cuts to my face as Daniel's talking. Also, I was a bit out of my depth in this interview. If you can bear through this, I recommend you use the interview like a buffet and skip to the parts that you're most interested in. The key topics we explore revolve around the importance of genetics in different sports. I left timestamps in the description and in the pinned comments to make it easy for you to skip to the parts that you're most interested in. I also left links to Daniel's work and his courses. Hope you enjoy the interview. I started with, you know, getting obsessed with basketball when I was young, uh, around 12 is where I kind of honed in on basketball. I've done a lot of other things like, you know, just recreationally or like neighborhood sports. But, um, yeah, I got obsessed with basketball and then had an older brother who, you know, used to, uh, grab the rim in our alley or whatever. And then I couldn't do that. And then, uh, you know, we ended up moving and then we got an adjustable hoop. And so then I was like dunking on low rim. And, uh, and then I started, doing a couple um, leg exercises that I'd also gotten from my uh, older brother, squats and calf raises. And uh, between low rim dunking and doing those couple exercises five days a week, um, I, I saw like this massive increase in my vertical when I was 13, um, like 13 to 14, and ended up dunking shortly after I turned 14 in eighth grade. And, uh, you know, throughout that process kind of just got – uh, really interested in training the human body and, you know, how it responds to different things. And uh, it fit also with my sort of natural aptitude for uh, math and puzzle solving. Um, you know, I was like a kid who knew his multiplication tables going into first grade. I was a kid who was doing crossword puzzles, like number puzzles, like that type of stuff. And I liked that type of thinking and those challenges. And then you know, taking that type of um, that type of cognitive uh, interests into you know training the human body, uh, it's just sort of like the the perfect math science puzzle blend for me. Uh, so yeah, I got really interested in it. Then uh, kept training my vertical, and you know, by the time I was fifteen, I was like, oh, I want to be a trainer. You know, like I want to I want to do this with people, and uh, so that, that that's kind of the origin story there. And, uh, you know, I continued to I played basketball through high school, played a year of uh, D3 ball in college, um, but really ended up, you know, more passionate about training than than basketball uh, in, in some ways. And uh, so, yeah, I got an exercise science degree, started training people in college and, uh, you know, it just kind of snowballed into a career and, uh, you know, a website, online presence and a brand, Jump Science. So, uh yeah, that's that's kind of how it happened. You also have a background in engineering or physics, just because obviously a lot of your posts go into the details and a lot of physics concepts. You said like when you were younger, you, you like puzzles since like grade one. Is that where that came from? Or did you also study physics as well? So I don't, it's not like I got a degree in physics or anything. Um, I did, you know, I did uh, AP calculus and AP physics in high school and I, I excelled in those things. Um, that was almost as far as it went. I did take another physics class in college that was, uh, it was like a calculus based physics class and it, but it was like electricity and magnetism. Um, it wasn't anything especially relevant to, to, to athletic development. Um, so in terms of formal education, like that's it, it's not, it's not like an extensive physics background. 
but you know, one of the things I like to talk about is it, it's not actually high level physics that we're talking about when it, when we're just doing like, you know, what are the limitations of max velocity or, you know, what helps somebody jump high? It's really, it, it's most of it is actually not even like, wouldn't even be AP physics in high school. It would be like basic physics. It'd be like a force, uh, a for, uh, free body diagram. Right? right. Yeah. Like that's most of it is just understanding that. Yeah. Um, and then when you, you know, when you start talking about calculating, you know, impulses and forces that is getting more into, yeah, like, you know, college physics or like AP physics in high school, but it's not like high level stuff. You know, we're not, it's not quantum mechanics. We're not solving the universe or anything like that. It's actually pretty basic stuff, but it's just the ability to apply it to sprinting or to jumping or whatever you're talking about. Um, so yeah, like I know you talked about, you, you said, you know, my speed science series was one that you brought up, uh, having gone through. And I mean, that's essentially a free body diagram is all we're doing. It, you know, it, it's, it's high school physics. It's not, um, it's not high level, but it's just the application of that to sprinting. And that's the, you know, it's, the, it's a big gap there where people don't do that application. And I think that's true throughout a lot of you know, sports science education as well. People learn about a thing in a class so that they can pass a test. They don't apply it to movements. They don't apply it to the experience of doing exercises or coaching exercises. Um, you know, and, and so that was a thing that I thought really helped me is when I started training people in college, It I got the application of what I was learning in class. You know, I learn about the length tension curve of muscle and I'm like, oh, so that's why like we get really sore when we do full range of motion strength training because we produce more tension when we lengthen the muscle out, you know, just stuff like that. Um, so yeah, not a huge background in physics. It's really just the application of like pretty basic stuff. What are some of the most common misconceptions that you see within sports science when it comes to sprint speed, vertical jump, agility, punching power, anything related to explosive movements that you think are still common misconceptions or I guess, counterintuitive things that people don't yet understand well. You know, the vertical force being kind of the limiting factor in top speed. Um, I would say that's not so common anymore because we've had the research now for a number of years that have shown us that it, it is more about that vertical force application. Um, so that's, yeah, it's counterintuitive because it's horizontal movement that we're going for. But yeah, the key thing is that the only horizontal resistance you have is air, air resistance, which is very minimal. Um, it's really gravity is the thing you still have to worry about overcoming. So that that's one. Although, yeah, I think because of the extensive research we've had on it now, it's becoming less of a common misconception. Um, joint angle specificity and strength training, I think, is sort of a seemingly common sense, like intuitive thing. Like, oh, well, if, you know, we vertical jump at um, 80 degrees of knee flexion, like, that's where we should squat to, or, you know, that's where we should split squat to. And, and that's still a pretty, pretty pervasive viewpoint. I would say, um, you know, the joint angle specificity has some, some merit. Um, I, I would say that, you know, when you're doing heavy strength training, it is not specific regardless, even if you're hitting the same joint angles, there's a lot of things about it that are not specific. So, uh, it's, it's going to be general development. Um, and if it's general development, well, then that joint angle specificity doesn't really matter. You know, you don't, when, when we, uh, when we squat to a certain depth, we don't like only get stronger at that depth. Um, the idea is you get generally stronger. Now there are trends of, specificity in the, in the strength that you gain uh where you know if you if you do just squat to this angle you, you tend to get more strong at that angle than you do at other angles but that trend uh mostly exists at the higher ranges and then as you go deeper it becomes more general where you get more of a um more of an adaptation across the range and with that in mind, it's it's basically, you know, that going deeper gets you a greater general strength training or greater greater general adaptations. And if strength is 
you know, largely general, then that's sort of your more influential stimulus because you're going to get specificity from actually jumping and sprinting and bounding and, you know, all these things. So that's more of a philosophical thing for me that is not necessarily, you know, it's not black and white. It's not facts. Um, and it's not like, you know, everybody has now figured this out, but we used to know this. It's more of a thing for me that I think, uh, you know, I have a pretty good grip on it and I, I believe in this way and it's definitely somewhat countercultural depending on who you talk to. Yeah. But you, you will get more extreme viewpoints than mine in both directions. Right. So you get the people that are like, okay, a sprinter, there's no reason that I should ever do anything other than a quarter squat. And then you'll get the, even the other end of the spectrum, like everyone should just deep squat all the time because it's superior strength training. And then I have the more nuanced somewhere in the middle, kind of like we need to balance these things out sort of viewpoint. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, th there's that general public, uh, youtube instagram comment oh well you don't de you don't squat that deep when you jump so why would you squat that deep with weight on your back well because we're not we're not trying to go for specificity here we're trying to just get strong uh so that's one um, another one this is like a personal one of mine when i was young uh you know teenager early 20s i was like if you can lift more weight you should you know like if you can get more weight on the bar to complete and still complete your reps you should and then you eventually learn like oh actually <laughs> uh one i can get a lot stronger by lifting 60 percent of my max um when i you know when i'm just starting like if, if i'm coming let's say i'm coming off of a, a, let's, a sports season or something and haven't been lifting very much and i'm going to start a program i could do 60 percent for five reps which is not hard at all and do that, you know, four or five sets, and I'm going to get quite sore. <laughs> and I'm also going to get quite a bit stronger from that. And so if I can get stronger if I, from lifting easy, like, why not do that? This is, this is actually a way that's going to allow me to, uh, you know, train consistently, make progress without just murdering my body with heavy strength training. Um, so that was a huge lesson I had to learn was, um, yeah, okay, so you're doing... 70% for 10, then you push it up to 75% for 10 the next week, and you push it up to, you know, 78% for 10 the next week, uh, you might get a really, really big change in strength in three weeks, but you also are going to run yourself into a wall. And if you can get stronger with easier weights, do that, and then you can sustain the progress longer. So that was a, that was a big lesson I had to learn, which again, was counterintuitive because you don't, you don't have any you know, wisdom about like long-term fatigue when you're a young kid who's just strength, you know, just getting into strength training and it's like you're building these muscles and the weights are growing up and everything's just great. You're just like, oh yeah, just lift as hard as you can all the time. Why not? Um, so yeah, that was a big lesson to learn. I'm sure there are some others. <laughs> Maybe some will come to mind while we talk here, but yeah, there's those are a few. Would it make sense to try and to train close to your one rep max and to continue to push that just to increase that potential that you're saying doesn't actually make much sense in the long term because you can just burn yourself out? Hey, so it's like, do you think 60 to 70 percent? That's a better. Well, it's it's not that 60 to 70 is better permanently. It's just depending on context. You know, when you again, like when you're getting back into strength training or getting into it for the first time, it doesn't require heavy weights in order to make big changes. Um, but also, and then, yeah, I'm definitely not saying you shouldn't lift heavy, um, but it's OK, you, you lift heavy. How often should you do it? Um, what, you know, like of the times that you go into the weight room to, let's say, train lower body strength, like how how many of those, like what percentage of those workouts should be like pushing how much weight you can lift for a certain number of reps. And, you know, I would say pretty common practice is, well, we're only going to do that once per week. And I think that's a pretty good way to operate. Um, definitely you get people in, in condition sometimes, or like, you know, you catch these, catch these waves of adaptation where, okay, we're doing this two or three times per week. You know, we're hitting like heavy five or heavy four, or heavy twos, you know, something two or three times per week. And we're getting stronger over the course of these couple months. And it's awesome.
but it's not normal. That's not like the usual scenario. Usually if you lift that heavy that often, you're going to get like a, a quick little burst and then you're going to start to fade. Your strength is actually going to go down uh, because of that fatigue factor. So yeah, it's de I'm definitely not saying you shouldn't do it. Definitely not saying like a certain percentage is like the ideal percentage. It's just a matter of learning how often can I push myself in this way? And I would say for me personally, yeah, I, I've never had a good long-term um, strength progress lifting heavy, even once per week. I, I like, for whatever reason, I just tend to run into a wall pretty quickly when I do heavy weights. So I do a lot better with like light and moderate weights and then just sort of touching heavy here and there. Um, yeah, and <laughs> I've learned that lesson like 50 times at this point. Like I get excited about something. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I've even done the extreme of, I've done heavy squat singles six days a week. And I've actually used that to push myself to the highest strength that I've ever had, but it's only, it only lasts for two, three weeks before it's like, uh, no, I can't quite hit that weight again. Oh, now I'm dropping down a little bit more. Now I'm dropping down a little bit more. And I'm like, shoot, <laughs> like I got to stop. Like, all right, you know, I got to back off. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a, a balance to be learned there. And I don't, I don't think there's any magical formula that, that, um, uh, works for everybody, but you know, sort of your one day where you do hit something heavy and then one day where you stay more fast per week is uh, is like a pretty pretty common and pretty good approach to have. Um, and then you just sort of modify it from there, you know. One of the most common questions I get is how much of agility and maximum sprint speed is genetic and that can't be trained. For example, when you see two kids, maybe 12-year-old kids, in a sprint race, it's not that one of them has a superior mentality or superior character. It's more they <laughs> have, you know, body dimensions and other physiological factors that allow them to do that. They're both pushing at 100 percent. Right. Mm -hmm. But what are some of those genetic factors uh, that influence speed? And then what can we do to train them? And are there any that can't be trained? I know that's a loaded question, but I'll let you kind of take yeah. it from there. Yeah, big topic. Um, I mean, I would say factors are you know the nervous system is a big one um you know how fast you can fire um how hard you can fire and um and then also like reflexive things involved with the nervous system um fiber typing i think is is a big one um you know slow twitch versus fast twitch and having a natural high high percentage of fast twitch is a big one um structure um you know having like uh the natural ability of building muscle or building muscle easily it is one but that's one that can all is also you know probably not ideal for if we're talking about like track speed where we want to stay light um and then and then along with that structure is sort of this okay you have muscle structure then you have um yeah tendon structure and and fascia and are you do you naturally have thick fascia that um you know makes up a, a larger percentage of your soft tissue than other people and that might be a trait that you know in the lower leg it band thoracolumbar fascia like is that a key trait of high level sprinters um i would i would guess yeah um, so, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things. Oh, and then, I mean, yeah, body types, right. Um, narrow people tend to be better for linear speed, um, linear speed and speed jumping. Um, whereas yeah, wider people are, you know, more likely to excel in two foot jumping, broad jumps, things like that. Not that they couldn't be fast as well, but, um, you know, it's, it's another factor. So yeah, I think there's a lot of things in there. Um, the yeah, the skeleton would be the one that you can't train. You know, like you, if you're if you are four feet across at the shoulders, <laughs> you know, you can't. You're not going to be able to change that. Um, but all those other things, I would say, are trainable. You know, your 
uh, your fascia. Obviously, you can train yourself to build muscle, build strength. You can uh, change your nervous system, like train it to do things differently. Um, you can train reflexes, um, and you can even you can even mess with your fiber types. You know, if you utilize uh, training very fast and then resting, uh, would be the way to manipulate that. Now, the degree to which you can manipulate those things. I think is limited. Like you don't, it's not just, you know, it's nurture is not going to completely overcome nature. Um, yeah. We're not going to take a kid who is naturally, you know, heavy, flat footed, um, slow, overweight, thick, and turn them into an Olympic sprinter. It's not like that. That's not going to happen. Um, Everything is trainable to some degree. Exactly what degree? I mean, that's where I, I don't know. I don't have like a, a real clear answer on that. I don't think we have, um, we don't have the ability to even necessarily find that out. Uh, we, you know, we don't understand things even well enough yet, I wouldn't say. Um, but for example, even like the fiber typing thing, you know, we, we do have the ability to measure fiber types, but taking muscle biopsies is not something that we do like a ton of. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a painful process for the uh, participant. You have to literally take a tiny chunk of muscle fiber out. So it's like, we have limited data on that. And so, yeah, how much is it possible to change it over time? Not sure exactly, but there is consistent results with, um, you know, with resting of, of observing that, you know, the overshoot phenomenon, uh, that, that is like, a, a consistent thing and it also you know with sedentary people compared to like endurance trained people it is consistent that uh even you know even two twins with identical genetics end up with very different fiber type distributions so it's trainable exactly how much hard to say um yeah the the tendon and fascia that factor you know I, we're not at the level of understanding like what exactly is different in the lower leg of an elite sprinter versus a power lifter you know like we, we sort of we can make we make external observations of maybe thinness versus thickness of the calf um, or length of the tendon versus shortness of the tendon um, and we can sort of identify some trends in that way there are measurements like fascicle length of your of your muscle fibers um, which tends to be higher in, in sprinters, uh, but it's sprinters compared to regular people or sprinters compared even to endurance trained people, um, a sprinter compared to a power lifter, maybe, or maybe compared to somebody who does calf raises three times a week. Uh, I'm not even sure. I don't think we have that data yet, but so I don't, you know, I don't think we even understand fully all the differences there. Um, I, th I know people like to talk about the length of the Achilles tendon, but, you know, we got, uh, Stefan Holm, you know, in some ways, the greatest high jumper of all time had a short Achilles tendon, which sort of defies the whole, the whole theory, you know, of like this, you know, so it's, um, yeah, you know, we just don't exactly know what are the differences in the fascia and the tendon of an elite sprinter versus, yeah, somebody who, somebody who walks. 10 miles a day or versus a power lifter and you know without even knowing those differences how can we measure how much they're trained how can we measure the limits of that you know <laughs> so that's maybe that's part of sports science future right there um but I, I don't think we're there yet um but as a coach i can say that the you know elastic abilities can change you know, people can get lighter on their feet. They can increase their reactive strength index. They can improve their maximum velocity. And exactly what are the tendon and fascia changes that happen in that moment? And, in, in you know, when, when those changes happen to performance, I'm not sure. <laughs> that's, you know, that's still a, a big question mark for me is like, if we could understand this better and actually have measurements on it and track it over time, you know, that would be really helpful, I would say. Um, but that's, yeah, it's an area that's still still in its infancy, I would say. <laughs>
long-winded answer to that. As a coach, just based on what you've seen and your experiences, do you think someone with average genetics, you could say maybe like five foot nine, not obese, just average body weight, do you think that they would be able to reach an elite level of sprinting ability? Not not say, for example, in track where you're trying to reach the elite level in track, but let's say it's a soccer player. Five foot nine, speed is important, but it's not the only factor in the sport. How much percentage increase do you think they could improve in their um, speed when it comes to agility and maximum speed? And do you think that the average genetic athlete does have the capacity to train to reach a, an elite level within their sport for explosive movements? Yeah. So, um, yeah, first of all, that, you know, the average, average genetics, um, if, if we're talking, you know, average of the population, then I'm going to say, no, if we're, if we're talking, average of athletes who are let's say at least at the high school level like decent i think most of those athletes yeah let's say people who can at least make the varsity soccer team right i would say most of them are capable of at least sprinting nine meters per second max velocity if they, if they were trained well if that piece is there then the acceleration abilities and the agility um, are likely also um, able to be at a high level. Um, I don't have a great, you know, the nine meters per second is a, is a number. Um, I don't have a great measure for agility that I can just, you know, throw a number at you for, but, uh, but yeah, I would say, you know, most people are, or most, again, yeah, most high school athletes are probably capable of getting above a one and a half body weight squat and also capable of sprinting nine meters per second. And between those two things then, so those are like the two ends of the spectrum, right? Um, between those two things, then they should also be able to do some some very good things. Like maybe a, you know, a, a, a nine foot broad jump is probably attainable maybe a you know 34 inch vertical jump or something like that um those of course would have to be related to your height to have a better standard so you know maybe it's a maybe it's a uh uh 1.7 times your height broad jump or you know something like that um so yeah i think reaching a pretty good level is is attainable for you know sort of your just just reasonably gifted athlete you know somebody yeah somebody who as a kid they were one of the more athletic kids and they can make a high school sports team you know i think a lot of those things are attainable um yeah getting to elite levels you know do i think everybody could have a 48 inch vertical no um but they might be able to get to 40 <laughs> you know with years of good training um and, and uh, yeah, elite level, you know, is everybody going to run a 10.1 or faster in the 100? No. Um, but they might be able to get to 11.2, you know, something like that might be fairly attainable. Uh, or 11.2 might be a little ambitious. Maybe 11.6, you know, is and 11.6 is in most sports, you know, outside of track, 11.6 is like a, a fast athlete. Yeah, unless you're talking about like the NFL. Um you know, where a lot of those guys have track backgrounds and, you know, they run at 10 something, um, which that reminds me, yeah, the, the average genetics, I think you said in your email is like five, nine, one ninety seven. I was like, that's actually where a lot of NFL cornerbacks tend to be is <laughs> like, you know, like five, five, nine to six foot. And then, yeah, like 180 to 210, somewhere in that range. Like that's actually right where they're at. So, um, yeah, the height and weight is, uh, you can still be really athletic with average height and weight, I would say. If you had a magic wand and you could just sculpt the perfect body for mm -hmm. maximum sprint race, like a, a hundred meter race, what would that look like? So, you know, if we're not dealing with the reality, but, you know, just, yeah, let's say it's science fiction. I mean, a, a hundred meter tall person who can take one step and finish, assuming that it doesn't take them. 10 seconds to swing their leg from, from the front to the back. Um, you know, in, in more of a actual human type of description, honestly, 
a a young LeBron James, um, and then keep him thinner than he did. He, you know, don't go to two sixty or whatever. Um, yeah, the talent that he had with the height that he has is is probably like where the ideal uh, the ideal sprinter would be. Um, yeah, the combination of those things. So I definitely think LeBron could have been a track and field world record holder. I don't know. The, I mean, the hundred meter dash top speed is so so unique, so specific to being able to get off the ground really, really fast. So I don't know for sure that he could have been like a, a you know hundred meter world record holder. But for sure, I think he could have been a long jump world record holder. Um, I mean, you see that guy take off from near the free throw line in game off of like six steps. And this is a uh, early years for the Cavaliers against the Bucks. Um, yeah, he has this dunk from near free throw line. You know, he finishes with his forearm on the rim like this. And he lands, he lands on the baseline, which is four feet behind the backboard. You know, and he and he did this in game, like with just he, he got the ball at about half court and just ran and did it. And it's like, dude, this guy, unreal. Um, so yeah, that type of like that combination of height and athleticism, I think, is where where that that prototypical hundred meter sprinter would be. Um, yeah, he may not be the fastest out of the blocks, but. Finishing the race, I think, you know, that that's the type of athlete that has the potential to be, you know, 12.5 meters per second, you know, top speed, like just even beyond where Bolt was. And uh, and then, yeah, dip in, you know, sub nine five or whatever, like that, that would be the type of athlete to do it. Of course, somebody could also do it at five foot ten. You know, we don't know. <laughs> um, you know, there's a, a different set of advantages that come with being a little bit shorter, uh, typically. So um yeah you know you never know what, what you're going to come across what are some of the advantages that you get from being short and what are some of the advantages of being tall and i guess for context as well in soccer the two best players in the world ronaldo and messi they just have completely different body types ronaldo's i think six foot two six foot three very explosive high vertical jump very powerful shot whereas Lionel messi is shorter but he has the best agility right he's able to maneuver super well has the best dribbling as well so he's five foot seven so five foot seven mm -hmm. or six foot two, two very different body types, and those two are the best in the world ever. So, what are what are some of the advantages of being short, and I guess some of the advantages of being tall? The advantage of of length is that you know when you move a joint or move a lever, um, let's say when you move it rotationally, so like a certain number of degrees, right, like a, 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 of rotation in a lever, the end of that lever covers more distance. Okay, so if you, yeah, you know, you perform, uh, let's say, you know, a, a vertical jump, and let's say it's from a uniform depth, like in terms of the angles, you know, a, a taller athlete in performing that movement is going to cover more distance and during the extension of their body. And so if they were to be able to perform that extension of their body in the same amount of time, that would result in a higher velocity because it's greater distance in the same amount of time, you know, the velocity is distance divided by time. So, you know, that's the advantage. Now the, the advantage of being shorter is generally people have higher strength to body weight ratio. And that means we'll, and just, well, just shorter levers in general. So that means you can rotate your level levers faster. So, like I said, you know, in the, the case of the vertical jump, I said, if you could do it in the same amount of time, well, generally the taller athlete can't do it in the same amount of time. Usually it's going to take them longer to do it. So there's a trade-off there of quickness versus length. And so that's why, you know, length favors things that don't have a clock generally that are not, are not, um, yeah, are not limited by time. So for example, throwing, you know, when you can take advantage of a long distance that you're moving your hand, that's a big advantage. So in, okay, so let's say in shot put, for example, it's all big, big people. And they are, you know, remarkably strong and powerful as well. Um, but it's all large people. So they have, 
you know, that have some length at least. Uh, discus is another one. You know, length is definitely a big advantage. You don't see a 5'8 high level discus thrower. Okay, because you've taken advantage of that length and there's no time limit going on. Um, when you get to a lighter implement, okay, so baseball, right? It's like five ounces, you know, a fraction of a pound. It's, you know, it's well, well uh, documented or, you know, it's widely believed like being bigger and taller is good for pitchers to throw faster. But there's also guys who are 5'9 and who can throw in the 90s. And so with that lighter implement, um, you know, there, there's more flexibility in like the ways that people can make this happen. And so you get this, you know, these uh, really great arm talent and then you don't need as much length. And, you know, they're able to utilize, you know, all the, you know, this fascia throughout the body and rotation from the lower body and, and just whip this arm really hard. And so with that lighter implement, you know, it's more, people can solve that issue to that problem in more ways, you know, so you don't have to be a big and tall guy in order to be a really, really fast pitcher. Um, whereas yeah, with those heavier implements, a, a javelin is another example. So javelin is not that heavy. Um, and so, you, you know, your javelin throwers generally are not as long as your discus throwers. Um, j yeah. Javelin's different. Javelin, yeah, javelin is, uh, you know, the big approach makes a big difference in there. And in terms of, like, the type of athlete who's able to do that, um, or, yeah, the, the shot put, yeah, you know, shot putters are generally a lot bigger than javelin throwers. So, yeah, when there's no clock going, though, that's where you have this advantage of length. When it comes down to quickness, um, that's where the, the being shorter tends to be an advantage, and that's where you get the um, – the, you know, shorter athletes tend to be more agile. They tend to be able to get off the ground faster. And so, you, you know, you have the short guy who beats people off the line in a race. Okay. Um, and, and, and then, yeah, it's very shifty and quick and short, short spaces or small spaces. Um, yeah. You know, open field tackling and football, you see like, uh, you know, Barry Sanders or, uh, you know, like that type of running back who no one can, no one can one-on-one uh, -on -one bring them down in the open field, right? Um, and so, so yeah, it's that length versus quickness. And then, so top speed is the interesting one because this is a clock running. This is, you have to be very quick off the ground. But, uh, but there, you know, Usain Bolt, fastest ever. And like I said, I, you know, I said LeBron James, young LeBron James being the prototype, um, that's where, yeah, it's this combination of length and quickness. <laughs> um, and so it's, yeah, it's kind of tricky, how, like figuring that out. But that's where, you, you know, if you look at most of the best athletes, the the absolute fastest sprinters, your uh, even your, you know, most uh, like football speed, rugby, like those, these types of people. Um, and then people with, you know, 45 plus inch vertical jumps. Most of them are actually in that like five nine to six foot one range. You know, it's somewhere more in the middle, um, where it's a balance. Yeah, and so that yeah, you know, the, the different movements sort of maybe shift that around a little bit, like what's ideal. But it's usually not the you know, it's usually not the five five guy and or the seven foot guy who are the best at at things. Um, cause you, you, yeah, you want like a piece of both of those, those advantages. So, um, yeah, like if you looked at, you know, the dunk community, the people with 48 inch verticals, you know, they're, they're mostly in that middle range somewhere. Um, there might be a couple like super talented, like five, six, five, seven guys actually who are in the high forties, um, off, off two feet specifically. Um, but yeah, so it's an interesting topic, but yeah. So if you think about, okay, like a broad jump is another example. It's a big movement for maximum distance, like a standing broad jump, big movement, maximum distance. There's no clock running. And you also get, uh, you also get what we call takeoff and landing distance, which would be, um, the distance from, you know, where your toes are at to where your center of mass is at toe off. 
right? And then, so that's distance that you've, you've traveled past the point where you're measuring before you've even left the ground. And that's longer in a taller person. Right. And then same thing, landing distance, the point where your heels hit and where your center of mass is, is it going to be a little bit longer? So that's yeah, landing distance. And that's um, distance that you're getting uh, just from putting your feet out in front of you, basically. Right. So you get this advantage of distance. But then you also have, again, what I was talking about earlier, as you extend your body, if you do that in the same amount of time, you generate more velocity, which leads to, you know, a longer flight. So height is a big advantage in broad jump. But the reason that seven foot people don't, you know, have like the longest broad jumps because they're usually very weak relative to body weight. So they can't, they can't accelerate their levers the same way. Which is why, yeah, you look, you know, for the, the longest standing broad jump, you look at track and field, uh, track and field sprinters and jumpers. And then also you look at the NFL combine where, you know, we have multiple people going over 11 feet and the, the, you know, the record is 12 foot three. And those are, you know, usually five, nine to six foot one type of people. They're somewhere in the middle, uh, exceptionally, exceptionally strong and powerful relative to their body weight. And so they're able to accelerate their levers really fast. And then they also have, you know, at least some of that height advantage compared to, you know, somebody who's five foot four, maybe they can complete their broad jump really quickly, but the end velocity of that takeoff is not as high. So yeah, it's that, that balance of those factors. And uh, yeah, obviously, you know, if you're listening to this, you can probably think of examples that violate everything I just said, you know, like <laughs> there is a lot of, a lot of variety among human beings. And, and uh, like I was talking about with the throwing the baseball, um, you know, there's different ways that people accomplish really high level of performance. Um, so yeah, none of this is hard, fast rules, but, uh, yeah, that's the general trend is for length, uh, or, you know, length helps you when it's, there's not a clock running. And then when it's, when you have to do things really quickly, that's where shorter people tend to be better at it. Instead of using the hundred meter race, it would just be easier to say, okay, 200 meter race. Then obviously the taller person would win since starting off like the beginning acceleration part is less important. Whereas for a 40 yard dash, that's where a little bit being a bit shorter and the acceleration component mm -hmm. is a bit more important. That's really interesting. If I yes. go back to the Lionel Messi uh, example, then it could be that Lionel Messi's five foot seven might actually be close to an ideal for that hypothetical magic wand agility prototype, right? Yes. Like, like that makes sense. What you said that he's shorter and he's also really agile, like that tracks, um, and it, it, uh, like the Barry Sanders, another example, he was like a small running back and, but, you know, terrorized the NFL because no one could stay in front of him or get a hand, get their hands on him because of how quick he was. Um, and so, but yeah, the other thing I want to bring up, like, obviously there's so much more that goes into being a great soccer player <laughs> than just your athleticism or your agility. So um, yeah, that opens the door for, Obviously, people who are nowhere near a prototype can still be at the very high level of their sport. Um, you know, definitely if we look at basketball, like there's been plenty of um, great scorers who haven't been super athletes, you know, uh, like I guess Paul Pierce. Say that again. Steve Nash, I was thinking maybe. Sure. Yeah, Steve Nash. Um, and now there's probably some some metrics where you could find that he was actually really good. Hmm. Um you know, maybe not sort of your traditional standing verb, broad jump, 40 yard dash. Um, have you, are you familiar with P3 sports science? No, I haven't heard of it. Okay. So they do, they do force plate testing on NBA players um, who do, yeah, guys who come to them for like free, uh, like free draft prep or some of them train with them for their career and they do testing and they, they have, uh, like force plate insights. So not just your typical, you know, vertical jump, broad jump stuff. Um, they're measuring like eccentric forces. Uh, they're measuring, you know, lateral things like, you know, you know, they're getting horizontal and vertical on the force plate. And so they have some of those insights as to like specific abilities that show up in guys that may not be your traditional, like flashy athleticism. So for example, 
Um, I think, I'm trying to think, I think uh, James Harden was like elite decelerator. Yeah. And so you probably don't think of him as, you know, the highest vertical jump or the fastest sprint speed. But uh, like on their testing on the force plate, he was like 99th percentile in that or, you know, something like that. Um, and I think, uh, I think Luca is, he had one of those as well. It was like, uh, maybe, maybe it was lateral force or maybe it was the de deceleration as well. It was something like that. Um, so yeah, there might be some of the more hidden athleticism that's, you know, more, uh, playing, playing a role in some of these sports where, uh, it, you know, somebody could have it without having sort of the traditional flashy view of, of, you know, huge vertical jump and incredible sprint speed. Right. Yeah. Huh. Very interesting. Okay. So that question was, oh yeah. The agility thing, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, prototype the, the, the prototype agility. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it would be, it would be a, a shorter person than the ideal hundred meter. So yeah, maybe it would be that five, seven type of athlete. Um, and then it would just be, yeah, really strong, really explosive, um, you know, incredibly quick off the ground or incredibly quick at accelerating their body in different ways, um, accelerating and decelerating. Uh, so yeah, that probably, yeah, that tracks with those Barry Sanders, Lionel Messi type of, uh, examples. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess all this actually relates back to the, the question I asked at the beginning where it was like, can, can the average person reach an elite level? It seems like it, right. Just given the fact that if we assume five, nine is average height, there's, there's many ways to succeed in, in various sports. Obviously, once you get to the more extreme or more physical sports, like in track and field, it might be a bit tougher, but for sports such as soccer or football, there's examples of short athletes, right. And you have your advantages there with agility. Mm -hmm. And then there's also uh, advantages to being tall. So it's, I guess if there's many ways in, in some sports to make it regardless of where you are granted, obviously that you're not at the extreme of either side of the genetics, normal distribution. Right. So. Right. Right. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's training can get you to a pretty high level of athleticism. Um, but then also expertise in your sport <laughs> and, and, um, uh, you know, toughness and grit and, and all these, you know, human components, um, those can take you from, okay, well, I'm a pretty good athlete, but now I'm a hot, I'm now I'm an NFL football player, or now I'm a, you know, a champions league soccer player, um, because I'm an expert in my sport, even though, yeah, I'm not winning a hundred meter race at a track meet. I'm, I'm fast enough. And I'm agile enough and I'm strong enough. And then I'm really, really good at my sport. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that's where, yeah, we were talking about, or I was bringing up basketball, like, um, yeah, Paul Pierce, you know, Hall of Fame player, not a super athlete, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I think the overall message should be to athletes, like, look, you don't have to be a genetic freak in order to be successful in your sport. And even in order to be professional in your sport. Um, you know, that is not going to be the defining factor. It, it obviously a factor it's, it's significant, but, um, yeah, you can be very great in your sport without being LeBron James. <laughs> I think when it comes to developing the mental part, the cognitive part of the game, game intelligence, there's really good research that all that can be trained and that there isn't very strict limits on that. But mm -hmm. I think there's way more confusion on the physical aspect of it. And that's where I do get a lot of the questions. Yeah. Okay, sure. I can train the game intelligence. I can train mental toughness, all that. But like, maybe I just don't have it when it comes to, you know, the genetic component of it. But obviously there's a lot of room for improvement there. And it seems like there is enough room for improvement where you could at least hit the the minimum requirements for the the general athletic abilities, where if you excelled in the other ones, like if you really pushed it in the, um, the cognitive aspects of the game, then you could still take it to quite a high level. Yeah. And and for the, the people who are maybe like, no, I can't get to a good enough level of athleticism. I would say that like largely, you know, the sports system and maybe like, you know, <laughs> the, the internet <laughs> that, you know, is a sort of the information age, like we're not doing that great of a job yet, like on a, on a large scale 
of having athletes training in like highly effective manner. Um, you know, I would just speak to like the culture where I live in Texas, huge investment in sports, like sports obsessed, like people are trying to do everything they can do in order to get better. But the, like the system is broken, you know, it's, um, <laughs> let's, I got to pick a sport to talk about it here. We'll say, okay, we'll say volleyball, right? Female, females in volleyball. Um, you know, age 11, I'm playing at school. I'm in club team. I got a private trainer all for volleyball and it's year round. At the middle school level, you at least have, um, you're going to have to do different sports throughout the year. Okay. At, at school. But then, you know, the whole year is club, club volleyball, um, outside of volleyball season at school. But uh, so at the middle school level, at least you have other sports mixed in. But so that means then that you just mix, you, you stack on track and field and club volleyball and private volleyball coach all at the same time. Okay. In middle school, you get to high school level. Okay. Now you have volleyball class period. So, uh, <laughs> you know, at the one school, they have a, a double block schedule, right? So they have four classes per day. And then the next day they have a different four classes, except they have sports class on both days. So that one fourth of their time in school is their volleyball class. That's, that's the entire school year. So then during volleyball season, you have, volleyball period plus after school practice or a game at school outside of volleyball season you have volleyball class five days per week um, at school plus your club volleyball plus your private uh, volleyball instruction um, so that is not the formula okay if we're if we're talking to volleyball players we're trying to say hey look we think that for a female getting a 30 inch vertical is it achievable over time with the right training that that volleyball system is nowhere near the the right training right that's nowhere near the formula that we need in order to get somebody there over time this is something that i get worked up over because you know i i deal with these athletes like i i coach them and i want them to succeed and i really think in some cases they are that they're up against it you know they don't the system is basically forcing them that they have to do all these things. And so then there's not really opportunity for them to develop as an athlete. Same conversation with basketball. I mean, it's pretty similar with the basketball, you know, school basketball period all year long in school, plus AU basketball, plus pickup games, plus private skills instruction, you know? And so then if you have somebody who needs to get stronger, needs to get faster, needs to improve the vertical jump, like, when are they supposed to do it? And when is their body supposed to be able to do it? You know, like they may be able to find time in their schedule. But if you have all this basketball going on, you, you, like your body is minimal adaptation going to be possible when you're just running yourself to death on the court all the time. So, you know, the the culture, the system is not in place in order to make make those, um, you know, the those athletic gains that we're talking about in, in order to take people to a high level over time, like it's not, we're not there yet. So if you think that, you know, this is impossible, it's not, we're just not doing it very well yet on a lot on like, you know, on a large scale. So there is hope <laughs> if you're, you know, if you're listening to this and like, Oh man, I guess I'm screwed. No, there is hope, but you know, the formula is not, uh, you know, your sport every day for three hours a day, all year long. You know, especially like as a as a youth athlete, a developmental athlete, like that's not the formula. Um, you should have an off season. You should have a down season where you don't do your sport that much. And then maybe, I mean, maybe you could do a different sport. Like that could be a piece of it. Like I know, in, like even when I was coming up, uh, you know, in high school twenty years ago, like multi sport athletes were very common. And now, at least in Texas where I'm at, it's it's much less common because of the what they demand from you in any sport it makes it very hard to put two sports together um so maybe another sport could be involved but also just you know the 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 time for your body to 
adapt to you know getting stronger or to doing speed training or to doing jump training you know that's what you can do with an off season or with a down season and that you know that can make all the difference as far as like where you end up uh you know by the time you're let's say 20 um you know it can make a huge difference in how athletic you are how strong you are and that might be you know if that's the limiting factor for you in your sport then that you know that can change your career right there um but yeah it's it's not just a matter of oh i just have to do this training you know your big picture has to be right or it has to be you know there is no right there's no perfect path but it's you know it, the 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 big picture is not 3 hours of basketball per day you know it's it's got to be somewhere more in the direction of um a healthy thriving flourishing body that can adapt to training and change versus uh oh i can survive all this you know i'm fine i can do another workout i can do another practice like i can do you know i can go at au and play six games in two days this weekend like why not i i can survive yeah you can survive you're fine you're 16 like you know you'll <laughs> you're, you're young you'll survive it um, but are you going to develop as an athlete while you're doing that is the question. Have you seen the video on Kobe Bryant explaining his training routine when he was younger, where he's like, if you've got 16 hours in a day, you got mm -hmm. two hours, right? So I think there's a lot of emphasis on that. But then if I was to ask the question or play devil's advocate, um, not because I agree with it, but just to, for the sake of playing devil's advocate, do you think that Kobe's routine was optimal? So, so you know, love Kobe Bryant, um, loved his mindset, his attitude, like all that stuff. He was speaking about, or, or, or I guess I don't know exactly what he's speaking about. I don't know the guy, but, uh, you know, the stories about Kobe and his work ethic and like waking up in the middle of the night to go work out and like, you know, this player thought they were going to beat him to the gym and then it turns out he'd been there at 4 a.m. and that, you know, he's leaving when they get there at 7 a.m. or whatever. Um, these are all stories of him as a professional athlete. He was not getting more athletic as a professional athlete. He was already super athletic as a, as a 18 year old. And, and then, you know, had a slow decline over the course of his NBA career, which is expected. Um, he was not, yeah, he was not developing his vertical jump at that time. He was not developing his sprint speed at that time. So, you know, he was becoming a master of basketball and maybe when it comes to motor learning and skill development, maybe there is some validity to, okay, more work is better. Maybe. <laughs> I wouldn't say that's a, a given fact. To the athlete who is, you know, 14 and who wants to be a professional at 22 years old, during that period of life, and let's say you're not Kobe Bryant, 6'7", 40-inch vert, you know, um, let's say you are 6'2", 28-inch vert, and you're thinking, man, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get play in college. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to this level, that level, um, without, you know, being faster, being quicker, having a bigger vertical jump, being stronger. You know, you need physical development. And that is not going to happen in the presence of three basketball practices a day. Also, I would say, um, you know, <laughs> with all the work that is put in, on the court in basketball, uh, it, it, this is largely a cultural thing now. Like most basketball players do a lot of basketball. How many of them have elite skills? You know, it is all the work really making us elite skilled players. Um, some, uh, you know, again, like the sport as a whole, I would say has evolved a lot and there's a lot more like great shooters now and that's changed the game and the scores are higher and all this stuff. Um, but you know, it is, is more work always making us better at things. And I don't, I don't think that's necessarily true, you know? Um, yeah. If, if a basketball player does 
20 hours of basketball per week versus six. Is that the thing that's going to make them a better shooter? I'm, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure that that's, you know, I don't think that that's a direct correlation there. Like, well, if you just spend more time in the gym, you will be a better shooter, you know? Um, and then also, you know, going back to Kobe Bryant, like he played soccer as a kid. And I guess I don't know exactly how much time he spent on a basketball court um, as a kid or even, you know, through high school when he was obviously becoming a great basketball player. Um, I, I can't speak to was he doing 4 a.m. practices in high school? I don't, I don't know. But, you know, I think I think if you look at, yeah, great players, great and, and you know, great skilled uh, players in various sports. I don't know if like just doing more work is is really the the thing that got them there. Um, it's hard to say exactly what you know. Like, why is Steph Curry the best shooter ever? Um, I think there's probably some natural talent. I think he probably had a good, maybe like family culture growing up of like, hey, we're gonna learn how to shoot and and get good at this. I don't know if Steph Curry does 4 a.m. practices. You know, I don't know if he does three practices per day. And I don't know if he's ever done that. I don't know if that's the thing that has made him a great shooter. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, there's sort of just this as assumption that more is better when it comes to skills. And I don't I don't know if that's really true. Um, you know, I think consistent work is definitely better than not working at it. But I don't know if you know, four hours per day is better than one and a half. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so that's, that's skill side and that's, you know, yeah. Motor learning. That's a hard thing to put rules on to, you know, to even have data on and all this stuff. Um, but definitely like the physical development side. Yeah. If you, you know, if you're sitting in a place where you need to physically develop more than, you know, than maybe the, the, path that you're on um it's going to be more or less impossible to do that if you spend you know multiple hours per day in your sport all year long it's going to make it extremely difficult to get the physical side of things so that's that that i can say with more confidence <laughs> the skill side is uh you know i don't know i just i think about a lot of the even in the nba you got a lot of these big guys right who like maybe maybe can't shoot very well um all the opportunity to practice you know nba basketball is their profession now and so all the opportunity to practice they can shoot all the free throws they want and okay yeah like uh you know you think Shaq didn't practice free throws um how how many of them, if, when they enter the league without a great shot, how many of them end up good shooters, like in in game good shooters? You know, like obviously some do develop it, right? Um, Anthony Davis is probably a much better shooter than he was when he entered the league, right? Um, you know, how's Giannis's jump shot? Is it is it any better than it was eight years ago? You know, I, I'm not obviously better. He's, you know, he's a little better in the post, makes some more bank shots. Like he does have like a little turnaround fadeaway he does on the baseline and that he'll make some sometimes. Um, is he like a de decisively better three-point shooter or decisively better like pull-up jump shot now than he, than he did, yeah, five years ago? I don't know. Do you think he's not practicing? What is really the defining factor there in skill development? I, I just don't think it's more time. Um and yeah, I feel like I had one more point to say on that. <laughs> anyway, I think, I think I got my point across. The next question I was going to ask was what are the biggest mistakes athletes make when it comes to strength and conditioning? But I guess a big part of it is actually the culture around it. Besides the culture, is there other standout mistakes specific athletes make that, you know, can be avoided from the get go? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say like the first thing that comes to mind is sort of that, again, it's that big picture stuff. It's not the actual workouts. It's the, okay, but how much, how much are you wearing your body out in your sport already? Um, how much are you eating? How well are you taking care of your body? You know, it's sort of the, 
those big picture mistakes, I think, are, are the first things that come to mind. Um, in terms of the actual training that people do, I think there's still a still an issue of like, um, oh, more is better. Um, and I just like, I just want to do all the things that I can, which like, it is a good mindset, honestly, um, to have, you know, like I'm willing to do what it takes. The issue is like, okay, well, what it takes is way different than what you think it is, or maybe than what, you know, what uh, the athletic development field wants you to believe it is. Um, you know, maybe maybe somebody wants to train you three times per week because they're going to make more money off of it. Um, but if you got all these other workouts going on already, maybe three times per week is not really the best idea for you. You know, and you may be very willing to do three times per week and you might enjoy the workouts. That doesn't mean it's going to produce the best results. Um, so, I, yeah, I think there's a, a that mindset of like more is better. I want to do all the things. Um, and then. There's the mindset or the just the perception of like, you know, just cool looking stuff is going to be the key. Um yeah, you know, cool, flashy exercises, things that like, you know, make for good Instagram videos and stuff. Um, you know, things that are really going to change you over time is going to be sort of just like your pure athletic maneuvers, you know, or your pure athletic pursuits, like, you know, sprinting fast, you know, jumping high um and getting strong or uh, relative to body weight over time which is done with like your fundamental strength training you know your squatting split squatting deadlifts you know pulling and pushing movements for the upper body um and and, and basically you know really the the basic forms of those things are actually really the foundation you know it's not um bands and bosu balls and and you know balancing on things and, and all this stuff like that's when you get into that sort of fancy training it might be very challenging um what you're getting from it is basically a skill of doing that exercise whereas what you want to get from it is a you know just a general physical development of strength or of um you know being able to bounce off the ground fast you know these are the types of things that you actually want so then you can go to the you go to your sport, which is your complex, you know, that's your, you know, I'm doing all these different movements within my sport. I got uh, opponents to deal with. I got a ball or an implement to deal with. Like, you know, your sport is where you have complex things and you have to like solve that problem. When you're outside of that training, you're trying to develop just physical capacity. And that, you know, that's done where you just, like keep things pure. Okay. So running fast in a straight line is objectively better training than running over wickets with a parachute on, right. you know, <laughs> it, 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 you, you want it to be the pure thing. Cause you want it to be really fast or you want it to be the pure thing. Cause you want to jump as high as possible in your, in, when you're training your vertical jump. Um, and so that's why you, you know, just, okay, just run up and jump over something high. Run up and just dunk a basketball, um, which that's a kind of another topic of like having fun in your training. I remember actually, but, I watched an interview that you had with someone yeah. else where you guys dived into that. I'll put a link in the description as well to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, run up and, and honestly, like, I'm not a huge fan of box jumps because the danger, but like running up and trying to jump onto something is good training it's instinctive like i'm trying to complete this challenge and and that's you know that's what it's about is sort of just that that pure athletic endeavor versus okay uh we got this band attached we got uh you know we're on one foot and we're trying to do a series of things like jump here and then jump there and jump there and and it's, you know, it's not like a meaningful series. It's like a, just a sort of random series of things. And it's, you know, once you figure out how to do it well, and so you can sequence it and all this stuff, it's going to look good. It may be sort of, a, in some cases, it might be a display of athleticism. 
but it's not the pure thing. You want the pure thing <laughs> when, you know, when you're outside of your sport, like just get something that gets you jumping high with maximum effort and preferably it's fun. You know, that's the foundation of things of your physical development. It's not coming up with exercises. You know, it's not, it's not inventing things. It's not doing things that look cool. So um, yeah, that's another thing. And this is, this is like on the coaching side of it too, is people talk about like fundamentals, right? And, and in some sense, I'm talking about fundamentals too. Um, let's say we're talking about sprinting and we have a, let's say a 10 year old who was like, you know, interested in track and field. The fundamental for that 10 year old is not you teaching him dorsiflexion. It's not you teaching him an A march. It's not you teaching him a, a B skip. Like those are not fundamentals for sprinting. The fundamental for him is to go sprint. That is the, that is the base of human motor learning and, um, and, and adaptation even, right? Is go do the thing. And so, yeah, you know, <laughs> the, I've, I've seen young kids learning how to perfect these sprint drills and running over wickets. And I'm just like, <laughs> I, I, I hate it. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it's bad that, it, that, you know, it's not detrimental to them other than the fact that they're spending their time doing that rather than something that would actually help them more, which is go competitive, competitively sprint or, or even go, you know, when you got kids and they, they're still raw and they haven't acquired this, you know, long history of movement and various movement like, okay, racing in a straight line is good. Also playing speed and agility based games is really good. You know, that's where the real value is. Um, it's yeah, it's not in, oh, okay, well teach them arm swing drills like that. No, that's not the foundation. What I see a lot on Instagram, especially for football players, is the speed ladder drills. Would you extend that logic even to say, even that it's like just train sports specific for the movements that you're going to be doing for your position in football when it comes to your speed movements. And then, you know, that's your explosive training. And then when you're not doing your explosive training, then that's where you go and do your physical training to improve your your window, your strength potential, right? Would you would you also say that speed ladders in that sense kind of fall into that same logic? Yeah, uh, speed ladders are, are an, a great example of exactly what I'm talking about. Um, in fact, I was even envisioning speed ladders and while I was talking about oh, yeah. some of those exercises, like where I was talking about the sequence of things. Right. Um, yeah, so speed ladders are a great example of learning a random skill. You know, there's some pattern that you're stepping through this ladder with and, but it's not a meaningful pattern. It's not something that you need for your sport. It's completely arbitrary. So what you're learning is that skill of doing that thing. And that's worthless, <laughs> arguably, right? Um, now there's an argument about like coordination and you know, that it's a hard argument to, to refute necessarily. Like it is coordination general though. You know, like if I take a kid and teach him a speed ladder drill, is he now going to be like better at learning something else just because he got coordination from doing that? Hard to say one way or the other, but why not teach him something actually more meaningful or have him do something that's actually more meaningful and, and and get him to become a good learner through that rather than through something that's so random. Um, now, from a physical development standpoint, the speed ladder is still foot contacts. You are at least planting your foot in the ground quickly. So it's not nothing in that regard. Um, it's just not particularly worthwhile, especially like, you know, if you're already going to do sprints and plyometrics and things of that nature then you know those little speed ladder foot contacts become more or less meaningless um but you know it, i'm not gonna say you couldn't use it to like serve some purpose if, if somebody you know if somebody's in a position of like okay well they need some a volume of foot contacts 
a speed ladder does give you some. <laughs> the, they're not particularly forceful uh, contacts because you're not really accelerating your body anywhere. Um, but, you know, it, it's not nothing. But like, so I have a, a coworker who uses a speed ladder once in a while to like help people warm up. And that I don't have any problem with that, you know, and he, he he's not, he doesn't think it does more than it does. You know, it's like, it's fine. Um, so yeah, it's like, if you use a speed ladder, help people warm up, maybe it's fun in some way, you know, fine. Um, but don't, uh, you know, attach the parachute do speed ladder followed by mini hurdle, mini hurdle, mini hurdle, uh, box jump, lateral jump. And then you do a three-step acceleration at the end. And then tell me that that's speed training, you know, like, just don't, don't tell me that um so yeah speed ladders are actually yeah classic example i think of just learning a random skill but not really getting physical much physical development out of it i know motor learning isn't where you spend most of the time researching i, I did just kind of want to get a perspective or general opinions if you have them what do you think is kind of elusive still about why some players do you think there's genetic component to motor learning as well or like yeah there's a big genetic component yeah. do, you, do you want to talk about I that do. briefly i don't know the gene right i don't know where it is on the dna strand um I, I do think there's a genetic component though. And I, I, I would say that just based on um, just observing, uh, you know, kids and at, like young athletes that I've coached, it's just like um, some people don't, don't learn things easily. And then, and they're also, there's other people that there are not good at like, you know, finesse, like finely tuned movements is just not, you know, it's not their strong suit. And they could have, you know, an athletic background of sport play from the, you know, when they were three years old and they're still like, oh, that this dude's like fast and strong, but don't tell him to swing a golf club. You know, like it's just not, I think any, any characteristic of people you're looking at there, you know, everything is influenced by genetics. And I don't know exactly what that, what all the genes are. And again, you know, how much is it influenced with all this stuff? Um, but it, I think there's definitely an influence. Like, I don't think that Steph Curry becomes Steph Curry if he's born Shaquille O'Neal. You know, like, I don't think that Steph Curry's nurture could turn Shaquille O'Neal into the greatest shooter of all time. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think it's influenced by, by genetics. How much exactly? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's all a mystery, but uh the other thing I was going to say is early childhood diversity of athletic movement and ath athletic exploration, I think is huge. Yeah. Kids who are playing multiple sports and, 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 or yeah, playing multiple games, climbing trees, all this stuff. Um, that is huge for, okay. By the time they're 12, how, how good are they at learning movement? How good are they at what? Well, and even just, yeah, like how athletic are they, you know, at this point? Um, diversity and, and of, of movement and just, you know, the natural way of, of uh, acquiring coordination is a, is a big thing. And so I look at like girls in gymnastics and dance when they're young, um, which honestly is more structured than I would like. In, probably in the ideal scenario, but still uh, gymnastics in particular, all the diversity in the movements and, and it's obviously a very much just like go for it and find out type of activity, you know, um, they learn things so easily. They get to high school, you, you ask them to do something, they just like, they just do it. And, and uh, not everybody's like that. And, um, and so, yeah, that, and then also I just think about like, the evolution of technology and the changes that are occurring with kids now. Um, I think about myself very much exploratory, diverse movements, childhood, like, and not structured. Like I didn't have coaches that wasn't on teams year round. I was playing neighborhood sports and all these things. Um, and I'm a very good learner. I can pick things up very quickly and it, yeah, it had nothing to do with anybody coaching me. It's, it's from a, just a background of learning. Like, you know, the human brain is really good at, at, at acquiring uh, skills and coordination. And so, yeah, I, I come across now you get more kids who are growing up on a tablet 
growing up on video games. And then maybe they even do a sport, but you know, if it's a structured practice under a coach a, a couple times a week, and then you're mostly sedentary or mostly, you know, not doing exploratory athletic movements and this type of thing, um, you know, you're still falling way behind. I think if you, you know, you just play a sport a couple times a week, that's a very limited movement exposure for a kid. So I definitely think uh, yeah, getting out of the house and playing games with friends and stuff and not being coached on things is extremely important in early childhood. And that, I think that has a big impact on the, yeah, the motor learning later. Um, the motor learning and the athleticism later. What is one question that you have regularly on your mind that you don't have a good answer for? Like an itch in your mind where it's like you think about often, but you just don't yet have a good answer for. Remember that uh, tendon and fascia thing I was talking about? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's one that comes to mind is, you know, what exactly are those adaptations um, and, and how much of a role do they play can we measure them? Can we, can we track them? Um, Cause I think this, this gets into the whole, you know, where does speed come from topic? And, and I think that that, and it's the, the thing that I've, the ability that I've in recent years started referring to as elasticity is essentially your ability to bounce off the ground quickly. I think that's a huge contributor to sprint speed. I don't think it's a matter of just like having faster muscles, mm. Um, in fact, and I, I've talked about this in some other, you know, some other like podcasts or interviews or whatever. Um, you know, I've had a couple, like the two fastest guys that I've trained actually two fastest top speed guys, um, were not exceptional jumpers. Um, they were reasonably strong, but not terribly strong. You know, if, if we looked at their, you know, just their muscular ability, their, you know, uh, the, like their their power in like situations where they're not bouncing off the ground. If we looked at it in those situations, they were, you know, average to good. Or even the one guy had like a, it was about an eight foot broad jump as a college sprinter. And yet he could, you know, he sprinted over 10 meters per second at top speed. That's a big contributor to to max velocity in particular, and then also like your faster jumps, like your long jump or uh, your uh, speed style. Uh, yeah, are you familiar with jumping styles and single leg jumping, like speed and power jumping? Very rudimentary. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll send you something about it. But you know, there's basically there's there's people when they jump for maximum height off one foot that do it more quickly than others, and there's a, a very distinct difference in the leg swing that shows up in those two different styles. So, and it's, so they're called speed and power jumping. So speed jumpers off one leg, um, I think elasticity is a, a huge contributor. Um, but it, it might, it like in their case, it might specifically be like in the quadriceps, it seems like they're very strong at the knee joint. Um, so yeah, that, that is the first question that comes to mind. Um, the other one would be, it's, it's just the matter of like, how do we sustain adaptation over time? Um, whether we're talking about sprint volume, jump volume, or lifting, or you know, lifting volume and lifting intensity, you know, what is the yeah, what's the formula there as far as yeah, you know, what should a week of running and sprinting look like for a sprinter? Um, and then okay, here's a good week. Well, then what does that week look like over time? Do we have to just keep increasing it over time? How often do we, you know, back off and rest? Um, answering that type of question is, uh, that's like the, the never ending coaching experiment right there, I would say. In the strength department, it gets back to like what you, what we were talking about earlier, like the, okay, the lighter lifting, the heavier lifting, how often do you do it? Um, how many weeks in a row should you do it? How long can you push on this, you know, like push at this level and then you have to back off and, and uh, sort of, yeah, solving those issues of, yeah, just getting sustained progress over time. That's that's kind of the the big uh, the big challenge, I would say, because yeah, you know, we always 
we could we have these examples of short windows of adaptation where you just feel like a genius you know it's like oh uh, yeah i told this dude to go squat and now he's jumping four inches higher and you know like in two weeks um and it's like oh, okay well that's awesome but you know what do the next two years look like for him if he just if he just continues on the same strategy like what's the progress going to be um so yeah figuring figuring that out which yeah definitely not a black and white thing not a there's no absolute answer but uh yeah just trying to acquire more understanding on that thanks so much daniel yeah for your time do you want to uh, tell the viewers where where to find your stuff and some of the courses you have just jump science on youtube is an option um jump dot science on instagram or also speed dot science zero on instagram so i have two two accounts one one for jumping one for sprinting um and then my website you can actually just type jump dot science into a web browser and that'll pop up and so i have uh, a number of vertical jump training programs available on the website uh for, for purchase not for free um but then there's also an entire page of articles, which uh, which are like educational and uh, completely just open for people to read. It's not you don't have to sign up for anything. There's, I'm not going to steal your email or anything. It's just uh, there's just articles that are there for you to read. Um, so yeah, those would be the places to access my stuff. I highly recommend them. I've read them many times over, and I constantly come back to them. So a uh, great resource. I will be coming back to them again, and uh, hopefully. Once I have even more knowledge that maybe we can chat again in the future. So. Yeah, absolutely.